But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. And the Lord replies, can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. The word engraved is like meaning I have tattooed. I have etched your name in my flesh, in my hands. I think there's even a tattoo shop called Etched in Flesh. There's probably more than one. But this is what the Lord has done. He has such a love for the apple of his eye, the nation, the people of Israel, that he has etched you on the palm, etched them on the palm of his hands. And your walls are ever before me. The walls represent their condition, their well-being, their safety, their security, their serenity. So he will never forget them. He has etched his hands with their names. And he is always continually concerned for their safety, their security, and their serenity. In the New Testament, we find that moving from national in terms of Israel to personal, to you and me. In the 10th chapter of John, Jesus is speaking and he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The great shepherd, he knows my name. He calls me by name. And I hear his voice sometimes. And I follow him sometimes, closely, sometimes from a distance. But I know that I can never be snatched out of his hand the hand that my name is etched upon. He knows me that well. He loves me that much. He thinks about me continually. He is always concerned for my safety, my security, and my serenity, and my peace. This is the character of the Lord God Almighty. Going back to Psalm 40, David Beginning in verse 17, if you'd like to read it. He cries out at the very beginning. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit and out of the muck and the mire. And he set my feet upon a rock. He closes this psalm in verse 17. I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer, O oh my God. Do not delay. Another translation says, I am afflicted and needy. Yet the Lord thinks of me. He constantly has me on his mind. He's constantly concerned about my walls and his hands 
are my reminder. You are my help and my deliverer, my God. Do not delay. I am afflicted and needy. Have you ever felt that way? I am poor and needy. This can be the condition of the sheep that Jesus shepherds. The sheep that he loves and would give his life for. Yet I am poor and needy. The Lord still thinks of me. When affliction sets upon us, Jesus is interceding for us. We talked about prayer the last couple of weeks. And from a personal perspective, there are times when I come up here on a Sunday morning and I find great fulfillment in the connection that I sense has been made on his behalf through his word, through the words that he has given me, the ideas, the thoughts to express. And I walk out of here with a heart full of joy because I know he has done a work. An affliction sometimes gets set upon me because of that, an oppression that comes. There is a spirit that brings fear. There is a spirit that brings concern and worry. And it sometimes sets itself on my shoulder and speaks to me. And I talked to Ed about this and he felt it sometimes too afterwards and I talked to David Smith because this was persisting to follow me and he said the same thing he felt it too and sometimes that affliction has to be carried around and there has to be battle done but Jesus is interceding for me that I would not fail, that I would not falter, that I would not lose hope and get distressed and depressed and discouraged, that I would not despair. He's sitting next to the Father and he's praying for me. And God gives more grace. Remember from last week? God gives grace to the humble, but he rejects the proud and the prideful. And when you feel harassed by the way things are going in life, by the difficulties that are looming before you, by the interruptions to the plans that we have made, by the things of life that just we all have to go through at times and times and times, Jesus is interceding for you. He knows you're carrying a load. He knows you are poor. He knows you are needy. He knows that these things have set upon you and how they trouble you. But he knows you. And he hears your voice. And he hears the cry of your heart. And he intercedes for you. And God our Father gives more grace. Joyfully gives more grace joyfully gives more grace. There is no judgment seat yet. There is only a throne of grace where we find mercy and grace. And when the storms of life come pounding like heavy waves upon us, he gives more grace because Jesus intercedes. And when we find ourselves in a place where we take sin too lightly, and we find ourselves in a place of distance and backslidden from the Lord, Jesus is interceding. Jesus is there. 
He knows what it's like to struggle and wrestle. He doesn't know what it's like to fail. But he understands everything that you have gone through. He is the great high priest who has entered into the Holy of Holies. He says he has gone through the heavens. Through the heavens. And he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and me. When we are weak, he is still strong, he is still faithful, and he is praying that you would be restored to the place that he has brought you to. The times when we take two steps forward and three steps back, he is there interceding, and God gives more grace. And perhaps there are times that you have experienced, as I have, where your faith has grown dim and your faith has grown weak. Maybe you just say, it's not worth it anymore. I'm not sure I really believe it. My prayers seem to be hitting the ceiling. I'm not getting the answers that I want as quickly as I want. When the reality of who Peter was presented itself to him and he had to look in the mirror and see face to face that he was nothing but a proud, boastful, egocentric man, Jesus says, I am going to pray that you would not lose faith. And he does the same thing today when we struggle and wrestle with those things in our lives that cause us to want to lose faith and to despair and to say, he's not listening to me. He's not giving me what I need. He's not giving me what I want. But God gives more grace. Our great high priest, our great high priest, he is in the Holy of Holies. He has brought the perfect blood sacrifice to put upon the altar of forgiveness. And he intercedes for me and for you in our troubled times, in our weaknesses. And to those with humble hearts, those who can say with David, I am poor, I am needy, yet the Lord thinks of me. Yet the Lord is continually interceding with the Father on my behalf so that, the, that the, the race that I began, I can, I can pick up the pace at any time because of the grace that is given to me. I pray that we would come to a knowledge of that that is real because there is no condemnation now for those that are in Christ Jesus. It's all about the ministry of grace, the ministry of intercession. When, when you... When I know that something is going on in your life, something that you're struggling with or wrestling with in your life, and you know that I'm praying for you, or you know that a brother or sister is praying for you, how does that make you feel? It gives me encouragement. It makes me feel good. The great high priest, the perfect one, the one sent from above is now in the realm, in the throne room of the Father, interceding on my behalf, on your behalf, for the things that we struggle with. And he, our Father, will give us the grace to persist, to pursue. And as it says in Romans chapter 8, let's turn there. Let's uh, start at verse 34. No, 33. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Who is it that condemns? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who is raised to life, he is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble 
or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus our Lord. When we can take that mindset and put it into action, in, into reality of our lives, that that is our relationship with Him, we can walk in a freedom that knows that all He cares about is us growing closer to Him, leaning on Him for grace and strength, and He wants to reward us for the successes we find through our faith. He will reward us for the successes that we find through our faith. Praise the Lord. The great high priest. Remember the hands. He is interceding for us. Every day. And in all things. Amen. Karen, can you come and we'll do that song now. Now may the God of peace, through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.